Fun. All right. Welcome. It's really nice to have you all here tonight joining us for our third of four uh, sessions. And tonight, um, well, first of all, I'll introduce myself. I'm Sarah Cruz, and I've been with the NHFA since 2010, and then uh, started serving on the board in 2013. And just this past September at our conference in Maryland, I stepped into the role of president of the board. So I'm working with an amazing group. Um, our current board is nine people, and they're, they're all incredible. I'm just honored to be able to be a part of this team and be a part of this organization and the leadership at this time. It's, it's very exciting. So um, tonight, I'm going to invite Tim Howell. He is our um, sort of tech guy, communications guy. He's been with the NHFA on the communications team since 2016. He's a longtime social advocate and writer. He brings a decade of marketing and public relations experience to the organization. Previously, Tim worked as a volunteer and chair for the LGBT advocacy group Vision at Bowling Green State University in Ohio. And he researches and writes about the way American cultures and media discuss death, dying, and funerals. And so here at the NHFA, he works to identify innovative ways to present death education and the realities of end of life through multimedia. And most importantly, to correct misinformation and inaccuracies in pop culture. And just recently, Tim pointed out to us um, was it a show on Netflix, Tim, that was... Yeah, The, the Haunting of Hill House. Um, we've got a blog coming up about that one. Uh, there's some issues there for, for sure. Some issues. Talk about misinformation and inaccuracies. They um, are making it sound like a really big mistake to take care of a deceased loved one at home. So uh, we're going to have to call them out on that. Um, before we get started, though, I'm going to give you a little bit more background um, at the NHFA. So I'm repeating myself. If you've been on these calls over the last couple of nights, you'll have heard this before, but we want everyone to know that home funerals are legal and safe. Our mission is to empower families and communities to care for their own dead by providing educational opportunities such as this and connections to resources that promote environmentally sound and culturally nurturing death practices. All of this and more is on our website. If you wanna be listed in one of our directories or if you're looking for home funeral guides or education programs, um, celebrants, clergy, home funeral friendly funeral directors, it's all on our website which is homefuneralalliance.org. We also hope that um, if you're a member and if you're on Facebook that you've joined our, um, we have a closed group that is a discussion group just for NHFA members. And we've already got upwards of 225 members on there. And it's really exciting, lots of conversations and we're able to discuss all things home funeral there. Um, also, NHFA has no paid staff. We are 100% volunteer run organization and we count on donations in order to be able to operate. And this series of learning seminars and webinars is the kickoff of a month of fundraising. We're um, trying to, we're trying to get up to $12,000. So um, that's 8,000 that will help us to just keep the lights on, um, keep everything running, and then um, we have some innovative ideas coming up. I'll tell you a little bit more about those at the end. So tonight, we're gonna try to keep it to about an hour at the most, and hopefully it'll be uh, a, more of a discussion. And I am gonna let Tim describe to you uh, what his vision for tonight is. So Tim, it's all yours. Fair enough, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, as Sarah was implying, um, this session is probably going to be a little bit different um, than the previous ones you may have sat on uh, over this past weekend. 
um, we're really looking to create more of a roundtable conversation um, because, you know, really at its core, art is about a shared experience. So we want to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to share their own experiences with art, um, either sharing their favorite pieces, uh, telling stories about um, either a piece or a video or a song or a poem that has moved you um, as we all sort of journey with our own understanding of mortality. Um, and, and that's really how we want to close out this session is having more of an open, informal uh, conversation around some of these topics. Uh, but to kick that off, um, we're going to start with a very brief presentation. Uh, I want to build a little bit of context and give a little bit of information about some of the history of how death has been represented uh, in art and in media over the past 300 years or so. Um, it's more interesting than it sounds, I promise. Uh, but uh, we're really trying to approach these pieces with a certain level of respect. Um, we're, we're here to appreciate the beauty, to appreciate uh, the purpose and the meaning behind these works. Uh, that being said, uh, particularly once we get into the 18th century and we're looking at maybe some more of the Victorian photography, um, some of these images might be challenging for sensitive viewers. Um, I expect it's nothing most of us have never seen before. Um, I tried to avoid anything that was too extreme or too out there, um, but we are looking at a, a significant cross-section of how death has been represented in art um, over time. So we might run into some um, adult language, we might run into some uh, imagery about uh, death and, uh, and bodies themselves. So be prepared for that. Um, I promise it's, it's nothing you wouldn't see in a high school textbook, uh, but it is what it is. I wanna give everybody that, that warning up front. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'm going to click on a bunch of things and try to get some stuff running. Fabulous. Uh, is, is everybody able to see the screen? Yes. Perfect. All right. Um, so I'll click through here. I'll try to go as speedily as possible. Um, and as always, if you have any pressing questions about any of the pieces that show up, um, you're free to send them to uh, Kim, Sarah, or myself in that chat feature uh, at the bottom of your screen. And uh, we can address those as, uh, as soon as we get to that portion. So I really wanted to start this off um, with this quote. Um, this is from Marion Peck. It's in the intro of her book, uh, Remembering Death Beyond the Dark Veil. And I think this really sets the tone for everything that we're talking about tonight. Um, our ideas about death are, by necessity, interwoven with our ideas and feelings about the significance and meaning of our lives and our place in the cosmos. And this, I think, is a, a critical component of how human beings approach death and how human beings approach art. Um, art is a, a very difficult thing for most people to define in any kind of neat and concise way. But really the most common understanding of what makes something a work of art is that it is the artist imposing their perspective on the universe. And that can be a two-way street. So. A piece of art might be the artist struggling to capture an emotion in a way that the viewers can experience it just like the artist did. Um, a piece of art might also be the artist imposing their will or their intent or their wish upon the universe by creating an idealized view or an idealized perspective. So that is really where the intersection of art and death lies to me is in this eternal struggle that we have as humans to understand where we are in the universe, understand our place, our purpose, and our direction, and how we express that to others. Um, do we create works of art to share our fear, our insecurity, or our acceptance? Do we seek out pieces of art and try to find meaning in them? Um, and that's really the foundation, I think. Uh, it could be argued that many fine works of art, if not all fine works of art, are in service to that acceptance of death. 
um, either the artist chasing immortality or the artist reflecting on the impermanence of mortal life. So that is really to set the stage. And now let's get into a little bit of the history. Um, I will warn you, I'm a bit of an art history nerd, so I do get kind of excited about some of this, but I'll try to keep my excitement uh, to reasonable levels. So let's start at the, at the beginning. Um, this obviously isn't uh, the first work of art ever created on the subject of death, but this is probably one of the earlier, more famous pieces of art. Um, this is a triptych. Uh, it's by a, a, an artist uh, out of the Netherlands, Hans Memling, uh, in the late 15th century. And a triptych is uh, three paintings put together into one uh, compiled piece. Um, usually these are religious in nature. They were typically commissioned by churches or cathedrals or um, nobility and wealthy family that wanted a representation uh, of their religious beliefs in their own home. Um, this is a very, very common triptych. Uh, this is called the triptych of earthly vanity and divine salvation. And in this piece, Memling is really trying to showcase in the center panel the beauty of life, um, the joy and the, the natural state of existence in this mortal world. Um, we have, you know, the human female, this eternal representation of life and um, regeneration and fertility, surrounded by animals, surrounded by lush plant life and a quiet farming village. But on either side of her are contrary representations of that life. In the left panel, we see a very common um, 15th century representation of death as a skeletal, uh, a skeletal corpse. Uh, coming out of the grave, you can actually see several other um, bones surrounding him and surrounding that open grave. And on the right-hand side, we actually see the burning fires of hell, because it wouldn't be a 15th century painting without reminding you of the burning fires of hell. Moving on to this next piece, um, this is an absolutely gorgeous painting. Uh, it's a tempera painting by Andrea Mentegna. Uh, again in the late 15th century, called The Lamentation of Christ. Um, the Lamentation of Christ is, a, again, a very, very common topic of painting in this era. Uh, pretty much any artist that wanted to make a name for themselves would paint um, this portion of the Christ story uh, in order to really catch the attention of, of anybody that might be paying them for their work. But this painting is very unique for a couple of reasons. Um, as we see in this call out quote on the right hand side, this painting pays special care to features of reality. So we very clearly see the wounds in Christ's hands and feet from being nailed to the cross. We very clearly see his swollen abdomen um, as he lies uh, dead on this bed. And this angle, looking from the feet up, it creates that sense of very much being present in the room. And this is really, you know, possibly one of the earliest paintings of, of a home funeral, where the goal of this painting was to make you feel like you were in the room with Christ. It's not an idealized painting. It's not mythical. It's not legendary. It's very, very simple and down to earth. Um, this is a unique viewpoint. Uh, there weren't a whole lot of artists uh, in the 15th century that were willing to represent the death of Christ in such a plain manner. Uh, and for that reason, this painting really stands out. And I think it's a truly remarkable representation of death in this period. Moving on out of paintings, um, this is a, a late 19th century sculpture known as the Angel of Grief Weeping Over the Dismantled Altar of Life. Um, this is the original sculpture by William Wetmore uh, story, and it has been copied globally. Um, you can find almost this exact same sculpture uh, in probably every major cemetery across the globe, uh, but this was the very first one. And this sculpture was done for Story's wife, Evelyn, um, when she died. And Story's goal was to represent the ultimate sensation of grief. Um, this is a celestial being 
who is the physical embodiment of the grief in the morning that story was going through at the time of his wife's death. So it's a very, very powerful visual, which is why it's been copied so many times to see this, this Christian symbol of perfection and um, really being above life and beyond the scope of the mortal realm coming down and openly weeping on his wife's grave. Um, it's a very, very, very powerful and very evocative image. Uh, and you're going to see this same type of image repeated over and over again um, into the modern era and even today. It still continues to crop up. So that's a little bit of the background history. Um, and at this point, we can move on into the 18th and 19th century, uh, which is typically what we think of as the Victorian era. It's a little bit larger than that, but for our purposes, we can call it the Victorian era. And this is really where we see mourning art and that uh, intersection of art and death having more of a family focus. It becomes less about the overall human condition and how all humans are walking this path of mortality. And it starts to become more about the personal relationship with death. Um, this is where we see the advent of photography um, and photography becoming a truly mainstream art form to the point where it is not unreasonable for a middle-class family to have family photos taken. Um, this is where we see the influx of ideas like um, spiritualism coming into play. Um, you get more Gothic ideals coming in where people are still spending time with the dead. People are comfortable with death. Um, it's not quite the Middle Ages, but death is still common. It's still very common for one or more of your children to die. It's more than common for people living in your home to die annually. So it becomes such a commonplace thing that representing death in fine art becomes less interesting. Um, it would be like an artist today spending all of their time painting public libraries and geometry classes in sophomore years of high school. It's just so mundane that it ceases to be interesting. Um, that's not to say that those fine art pieces didn't exist, um, but they became uh, far less of the norm. And so what we see start to come out of the 18th and 19th century are pieces that are a little bit more focused on the poignancy and the intimacy of death within a family. So this is another quote from Marion Peck. Um, I'll, I'll, not, I'll spare you the whole quote, but I'll, I'll touch on some of the most important features. So our first reaction coming to these pictures is one of shock. Um, this is a quote that introduced her book, uh, Remembering Death, which is a collection of Victorian morning photography. So coming into those photos from the modern day, a mainstream audience walking into Barnes and Noble, grabbing this book off the shelf and being confronted with 200 photos of corpses is a shocking thing. That's something you do not see in 2018. But in the 1800s, this was typical, this was common. You would have a family photo album with wedding photos and um, spring uh, trips to the countryside. And also right alongside that would be photos of your uncle's funeral um, in the parlor in your very own home, because that's what life was. Um, and these photos are important to look at today because these photos represent that heartbreak and that poignancy that we so rarely see today. Um, it's a little bit potentially classless depending on where you, you sit on the issue, but today we're seeing teenagers taking selfies uh, in the room with their dying and dead loved ones. It's touchy, um, it, it feels tacky, it feels like something that's disrespectful, but there's a long history of that. Um, and that's really where Peck is coming from, is this idea of looking at these dead and dying mothers, these dead and dying children, and seeing that they suffered and feeling that suffering and feeling that empathy, but also understanding that these photos represent intimacy, they represent love, they represent a concrete family 
and these photos might be the last piece of, of memorial media that the family can take with them into the future. Um, so for that reason, these photos are, are very, very touching. They're very, very meaningful. And you can pull a lot um, out of these photos. So I'm going to click through a few of these. Um, I'm not going to comment on every photo. I'm just going to give us a moment or two to linger on each one, um, understand the moment, understand what's being represented, and then we'll pick back up again after that. So for a lot of us um, that are in the home funeral space, uh, some of those photos probably look very familiar. Um, it's, it's no accident, as many or all of us know, that the home funeral culture today is very much hearkening back to this piece of our culture that many of us feel was lost. And this ownership over the dead and this ownership of that intimacy and that love and that poignancy, which doesn't always but can fall away um, in a commercial American funeral. Um, those photos really speak to me, particularly that second photo um, we can go back to here. I said I wouldn't speak over them, but I'm going to anyway. Um, the woman second from the right staring directly into the camera. This is a face I think any of us that have worked um, in and around home funerals have seen before. Um, this is a family that is in the most intimate of moments together. And without this photography, this family would not be able to cement this moment in their minds. And we sitting here today would not be able to feel the empathy for them that we do. Um, it is probably impossible to look at these photos and not feel that stillness in your breath and that's, that stillness in your heartbeat of being here in that moment. And these are potentially some of the most human artifacts we have from modern history for that reason. So the reason that I bring this up and the reason that I keep touching on it is if we want to look at today's society and today's culture, um, many people would say that photography has become disposable. Um, the idea of finding an old dusty VHS tape uh, or an old dusty reel-to-reel -reel tape of your family video, and, and it was the only one you had, um, those are gone. Uh, we have an entire generation of people, if not multiple generations of people, that are coming up today and recording every passing moment of their lives. Um, we see the good, we see the bad. Usually it's the extremes of both because that's where you get the most attention on social media. But regardless, we're seeing an entire new generation and an entire new culture springing up that wants to capture those moments. They want to be able to relive their grief, their sadness. They want to relive their joy and their celebration. And that is admirable. Um, whether you're taking your phone out to take a selfie in a hospital, is that trashy? Maybe, I'm not a judge, I'm, I'm not here to decide one way or another, but the drive to capture those moments is very, very human. And 
this 19th century photography really shows that and really proves how important that is to people um, for all history. It's something we've always done and it's something we always will do. So to close out our, our 19th century chapter before we move on to the modern stuff, which I'm hoping not everyone has seen, um, I'd like to surprise you a little bit. Uh, I'd like to talk about this locket very briefly. Um, Victorian mourning jewelry is, uh, again, a very well-known thing. Um, a lot of people are already familiar with this. Um, mourning jewelry was considered to be um, the most sentimental of gifts um, in the time of, of death. It, it's a way to hold on to a physical part of your lost loved one um, forever. Um, it was very, very common to have weaved, um, uh, woven patterns of hair. The hair of the, uh, the deceased would be woven together to create an uh, intricate design which could be put into a locket or a brooch or a ring. Um, that was very common. Um, it was less common, but you would occasionally see other uh, physical remnants as well. But this locket stands out from the pack. Um, this is uh, from Prince Alfred uh, of England uh, in the, uh, the 15th century, I believe. I think this was, uh, I'm sorry, the 18th century, 1780, I believe, off the top of my head. Um, Prince Alfred uh, was part of the royal family of England. He died extremely young, um, very, very, very young death. And as a result of that, his hair was not long enough to weave one of those intricate patterns and intricate uh, Victorian designs. And so all they were able to do with his mourning jewelry is this very simple wreath of hair within an intricate locket. Um, this is one of the saddest pieces of memorial jewelry I've, I've really seen in all the years that I've been looking um, for these pieces. It's such a delicate reminder of Prince Alfred and, and who he was to his family. This wasn't created to be publicly exhibited in museums for all the people uh, of the kingdom. This was created for his family. It was their personal private memorial to their lost son. And you can really feel that grief um, because it's so simple, because it's such a small amount of hair, it speaks so much about his short life. Um, and, and that I think makes a very, very poignant piece. And we're going to come back to this one later. So, so try to keep this one in mind. So with that, we've, we've really seen the history. That was very, very brief. Um, there's hundreds of thousands of pieces out there that I glossed over, but I wanted to give a sense of context and a sense of how we got to today as far as representing death and representing mortality through art. So now let's look at some uh, modern artists that are doing similar work and how they're approaching um, matters of grief and loss and, uh, and living as a mortal human being. Um, this first piece is a performance piece, so I have a, a quote representing it, um, and I'll, I'll read it off to begin with. Multiple forms of grieving followed Columbine. Uh, at the national level, approximately 70,000 people gathered for a memorial service conducted by the Vice President and General Colin Powell. During this ceremony, the Air Force flew planes above in the missing man formation, while the Colorado governor read the names of the 13 victims killed in the shootings. With each of these names, a white dove was released into the sky, symbolizing peace, soul's ascension to heaven, and the name of the school itself, Columbine, which derives from the Latin word for dove-like. So this was a, a public morning performance piece that took place after the Columbine massacre in 2000. Um, and I start out with this piece for a couple of reasons. For one, um, Columbine unfortunately ushered in a new era of public grief in America. Um, this was one of the first large scale nationally known mass death occurrences. And as a result of that, it was one of the first instances in the modern era where the entire nation was mourning together. 
So that national grieving process required this sort of a group mourning practice, a group funeral. It was a way for all of us as a society to try to find some closure and try to find some peace. So that's one reason that I, I start off this section with this, this quote about the performance, because as media developed, as the 24 hour news cycle developed, as the internet developed, and we as a people became more and more aware of our own mortality and faced from a very young age that death was always right around the corner and you could never be sure that you were going to see tomorrow. Um, the generation of people that grew up in the era of school shootings, the generation of people that grew up in 9-11, um, this is a, an, an entire generation of people that understand that death is unavoidable in a way that American society hasn't had to face for at least 150 or 200 years. Um, it, it's really a remarkable moment in time. And this performance, this releasing of the doves was quite possibly the most optimistic approach they could have taken for that event. And it really sets the tone that death might be scary, particularly violent, unexpected death, but it doesn't have to be scary for everybody else. We can take those moments and understand that this was a horrific tragedy and this is a fearful time to be living, but there can be peace. We can come together. We can sympathize with each other and understand what that shared human condition is. And that I think is an incredibly important statement um, that the Colorado governor was trying to bring out of this tragedy. So let's take a step back um, into the, uh, the 1970s, 1973 to 1978, and a photographer known as Anna Mendieta. Um, Mendieta did a series of photography uh, pieces that she called her Silhouette Series, which were an exploration on death and regeneration and the organic impermeance of the human body. Um, her silhouettes uh, series was created by um, documenting Earth over time. She wanted to show that nature itself was ephemeral and that the absence of something represented its own presence. And by that, I believe she was trying to say that when we lose someone or even when we lose something, if you lose your car keys in the morning, that loss has a presence. Um, it's the negative space of reality. And so when someone dies, their loss occupies the same space that their living presence did. It's almost like dropping a bowling ball into a bucket of water. You're displacing the area that that bowling ball um, is taking up, uh, where that water used to be. Uh, and at the same time, she wanted to clearly showcase that death was not the end. Um, as people die, we're returned to the earth. Our body is used as nutrients for plant life and animal life and insects. And there is this constant cyclical world that comes out of life and death and that constant pattern. Um, in the 1970s, this was... a. a, a a shocking revelation. Um, this was a stance that was coming out of spirituality and Buddhism and Hinduism and this period of religious intermingling where we were all starting to understand greater philosophies in the 1960s and 1970s. And um, Mendieta's work really captures that in a, a really unique and a really beautiful way. And this, again, is something that we see in that Columbine memorial piece, that even in this time of death, we know that the spirits and the souls of those 13 um, killed uh, children 
are still present. We still feel their presence in their absence. And they're still represented by the releasing of those doves. And they're not going to be forgotten. It's that same sense of impermeance, regeneration, and um, eternal presence. Jumping back uh, into 2017, we have an artist, Margaret Cross. Uh, Margaret Cross is a jeweler and a metalsmith, and she has modernized the idea of mourning jewelry. So if we want to reflect back on that intricate locket with the simple hair wreath um, of Prince Edward of England, we can see what the modern interpretation of that mourning jewelry is. Uh, today, hair is much less common. You're more likely to see glass pieces that integrate um, the ashes of cremated remains. Um, they'll roll that directly into the glass and you end up with these streaks and stripes of cremains throughout the glass stones, which are then put into pendants and, and rings and uh, bracelets and other forms of jewelry. So it's a way to carry that death with you, carry that grief, but also to carry that physical representation and the physical embodiment of that lost loved one. Um, Cross's quote on the subject, I think, says it better than I ever could. Um, she was inspired to create this jewelry after the death of her uh, fiance at the time. Um, and she says that, I felt the need to carry around a reminder of him, a piece to cling to and rub with my thumb and tuck into my shirt and wear over my heart. Uh, the necklace I made for myself in his memory brought me great comfort. So in this way, Cross is really encapsulating what mourning jewelry was and is all about. It's a way to physically connect with the dead. It's a way to show that they are always with you and that you can always find comfort in them, even if they're not physically with us any longer. Another artist, um, Caitlin uh, T. McCormick, uh, she works in fiber. So this is fabric pieces, yarn, thread, um, all woven together. Most of her work um, started coming to prominence around 2014 and 2015. She's still putting work out today uh, that is similar to this. And McCormick's work is really intended to speak to the impermanence and the temporary nature of life. Um, she represents animal forms in fabric. And the pieces are so fragile that even handling them can destroy them. And that is exactly the point that she's trying to bring out. Life is fragile. These pieces are temporary. Unless these are kept in an airtight container in a museum or a private collection, her work will degrade over time. A hundred years from now, 200 years from now, these sculptures will fall apart. Um, you're not going to be able to see them in the real world any longer. And that's the, the exact value and purpose that this art brings. It's a reminder to all of us how fragile uh, our physical reality actually is. This is a third piece by McCormick. She gets special attention from me because this piece, I think, is one of the most poignant that we see um, out of this collection of modern pieces. This is a piece titled uh, Safekeeping One. And it is two um, bird skeleton forms created out of yarn perched over a, a pair of shoes or slippers. And to me, this harkens back that famous, um, the Hemingway, what's the saddest story you can write with six words? Um, for sale, baby shoes, never worn. Um, that is, is exactly what this piece evokes to me. It's this sense of fragility and life and death over the physical object. Um, because, of course, how common is it for us to cling to simple things, shoes, ties, shirts, pillowcases that belong to the loved ones that we've lost, and to hold those as that representation of um, who those people were to us. These are some more modern pieces. These are a little bit lighter in tone. I'm gonna try to bring us back up 
um, for, uh, for our discussions coming up here in a moment. Um, these are illustrations by an artist known as Darker Days. Um, and these are traditional illustrations. These are from their new collection um, released earlier this year. Um, the piece on the left is entitled Blue Flowers, the piece on the right, Lost, Lonely, and High. And both of these speak to the dual nature of existence. Um, it's about understanding the mortality of, of the human being, right? Um, underneath, we're all skeletons. We're all eventually going to die. We're all eventually going to fade into bones and then dust and then nothingness. But we still have these moments that we're living now. And those moments that we're experiencing in life are just as important. And so Darker Days creates these morbid works that at first glance feel depressing and sad and low, but in reality, it's a celebration of these moments of life. And it's the realization that as hard as death may feel, our lives are so light and so beautiful and so joyous that we have to enjoy these moments while we have them. Whether that's taking a loved one out on a first date or whether that's smoking a joint and trying to get to the moon, relaxing after a hard week's work. We have to enjoy the joy that life offers and not live in fear of the death that may stop us from enjoying them. These skulls, um, these are called exploded skulls or Beauchene, uh, which would be the original anatomical term for these works. Um, these are performed by Ryan Michael Cohn. Um, he has become a very well-known artist uh, thanks to uh, an A&E television show, Oddities, um, that uh, focused on his store that he runs with a couple of other people here in New York City. Um, they focus on morbid remains and uh, uh, general ephemera uh, around mortality and um, other well, oddities, uh, believe it or not. And in his work, um, Ryan Cohn is really chasing two things. The first being he is exploring our own medical and anatomical past. Um, these exploded skulls are hearkening back to um, the 16th, 17th, and 18th century tradition of human remains as a learning tool, as, uh, as something to be studied and picked apart as we built our medical understanding of how the human body worked. Um, Cohn wants to make them more artistic. He wants to take that same sense of scientific discovery and that same sense of anatomical wonder at the complexity of our own inner workings, and he wants to create something beautiful. So this is both a memento mori and an artistic sculpture. It's a way for us to take a moment and recognize, yes, this is a human skull. This means that another human being has died. But also, when you really get in here and look, can you believe how intricate and how complex and how beautiful the interior of our own bodies actually is. Um, and it's, it's quite a remarkable exercise. Seeing these in person is absolutely breathtaking. Um, and uh, if you ever have the opportunity to see one of these works in a museum, I highly recommend it. Uh, you will never feel more in touch with your own sense of mortality uh, in the own uh, beauty of your form, as you will, when you're, when you're looking at some of these works. Um, so that's going to conclude the slideshow portion. Um, and uh, before we move on to the open table uh, conversation, I'm going to close out our modern era discussion uh, with a spoken word piece. Um, this is a spoken word performance uh, by an artist um, known as Kate Tempest. Um, and this piece, I'll, I'll introduce it beforehand so that uh, we can jump right into the conversation after the fact. Um, but this piece is really an in-depth exploration of what it means to be mortal today in 2018. And it's an investigation into the idea and the concept that we are not going to be the last humans on this earth. Um, I don't want to say too much more. I want you to be able to take your own conclusions out of the piece. Um, 
but it, uh, it it's a very, very moving piece. Um, if the accent is, is a challenge to anyone, don't worry. I, uh, when we send out this presentation um, after the session, I'll include a written transcript uh, of the piece so you can follow along as well. Um, but the piece is absolutely gorgeous. And uh, if you'll forgive me for a moment while I struggle with screen share, um, we will jump right into this video and then I'll give us all a moment to process. Uh, and from there, we will uh, go right into our roundtable conversation. That from Brand New Ancients, which um, is a long poem that is published in French now. <laughs> in the old days, the myths were the stories we used to explain ourselves. But how can we explain the way we hate ourselves? The things we've made ourselves into. The way we break ourselves into. The way we overcomplicate ourselves. But we are still mythical. We are still permanently trapped somewhere between the heroic and the pitiful. We are still godly. That's what's made us so monstrous. But it feels like we've forgotten that we are much more than the sum of the things that belong to us. The empty skies rise over the benches where the old men sit and they are desolate and friendless. And the young men spit and inside they are delicate but outside they are reckless and I reckon these are our heroes. These are our legends. The face on the street you walk past without looking at. The face on the street that walks past you without looking back. The man in the supermarket trying to keep his kids out of his trolley or the woman by the park bench struggling with her brolly. Every single person has a purpose in them burning. Look again. Allow yourself to see them. Millions of characters, each with their own epic narrative, singing it's hard to be an angel until you've been a demon. Now the sky is so perfect it looks like a painting, but the air is so thick that we feel like we're fainting. Still the myths in these cities have always said the same thing, about how all we really need is a place to belong, and how all we really want is to know what's right from what's wrong, and how we all need to struggle to find out for ourselves which side we are on. We all need to love and be loved and keep going. And all right, there's no monsters to kill. There's no dragon's teeth left for the sowing. But what there is, is the flowing of rain down the gutters. What there is are these muttering nutters. What we have here is a brand new mythic palette. You know, the parable of the mate you had who could have been anything, but he turned out an addict. The parable of the prodigal father returned after years in the wilderness. Our morality is learned through our experiences gained in these cities. In all of their rage and their tedium. And yes, our colours are muted and beige. But the battles, oh, they rage all the same. We are still godly. Call us by our name. We are perfect because of our imperfection. We must stay hopeful. We must stay patient because when they excavate the modern day they'll find us the brand new ancients see all that we have here is all that we've always had we have jealousy tenderness curses and gifts but the plight of a people who have forgotten their myths and imagine that somehow now is all that there is is a sorry plight all isolation and worry the life in your veins it is godly Heroic. You were born for greatness. You can believe that. You can know it. You can take it from the tears of your poets. There has always been heroes. There has always been villains. And yes, the stakes may have changed, but really there's no difference. There's always been heartbreak, greed and ambition, bravery, love trespass and contrition we are the same beings that began and we're still living in all of our fury and foulness and friction these are everyday odysseys we have dreams we make decisions the stories are there if you listen the stories are here the stories are you and your fear and your hope is as old as the language of smoke, the language of blood, the language of languishing love. The gods are all here because the gods are in 
us. Man, the gods are in the betting shops, the gods are in the calf, the gods are smoking fags out the back. The gods are in their office blocks, the gods are at their desks. The gods are sick of always giving more and getting less. The gods are in the supermarket, the gods are walking home. The gods can't stop checking Facebook on their phone. The gods are in a traffic jam, the gods are on a train. The gods are watching adverts, the gods are not to blame. The gods are working for the council, the gods are on the dole. The gods are getting drunk, pissing their wages down the hole. The gods are in their gardens and they're tearing up their plants. The gods are in the classrooms. Those poor things don't stand a chance. The gods are trying to tell the truth, but the truth is hard to say. The gods are born, they live a while and then they pass away. They're in a crowded street. It's too much. They feel sick. They're sure there must be more to life, but they don't know what that is. These gods have got no oracles to translate their requests. These gods have got a headache and a payment plan and stress about when next they'll see their kids. They are not fighting over favourites. They are just getting on with it. They are the brand new ancients. So that's the brand new ancients. Um, it's uh, it's a powerful one, I know. Um, and I think uh, I spoke a lot longer than I thought I would, but um, we can still take a few minutes to go through and share um, some ideas, some work, some art that we all enjoy um, and that we think can contribute to to this greater conversation. So we're definitely still going to open up here in a few minutes, unless everybody needs to run at nine o'clock. You won't hurt my feelings, but but I would love to talk to a few of us. Um, so, uh, to, to kick things off, I think we can, we can talk on a few topics really quickly. The first, um, let me give a little bit of my view of that last piece, Brand New Ancients. Um, that poem to me is very much the embodiment of everything we've been talking about tonight. Um, Kate Tempest is going through this entire examination and exploration of human nature to avoid our own mortality and to seek immortality in unrealistic ways. So when she refers to us, our current living subset of human beings, as the brand new ancients, what we're really talking about is this idea that our culture and our choices and our media are the legends of human beings 8,000 years from now. And that we need to maintain this perspective where humans have this, this built-in desire to look at this moment of time, this year of existence, as the end of a timeline. When in reality, we're in the middle. We have millions of years before us, we have millions of years after us, and we need to understand what our place actually is. And we need to understand the unnecessary worry over tiny moments and the necessary joy and embrace of creating our own stories and becoming our own gods and becoming our own legends and creating existences that our thousandfold descendants will be talking about and telling stories about. And there's such a beauty to that idea um, in embracing the impermeance of our own existence as a way to give it meaning to someone else. Um, and, and that's what that means to me. It's art, I'm not right, those are just my opinions. Um, and uh, to, to start passing the mic around, um, I know uh, Sarah has a couple of uh, recent stories to share to get us started. And then um, if everyone wants to take a couple minutes, we can go sort of one by one. I can call people out or, or however we want to do it um, to, uh, to talk about you know, any of the works that we looked at today or, or anything that you want to share outside of that. Um, so I'm going to take a water break and uh, and I'll I'll let someone else talk for a moment. All right. Well, I want to um, just let everyone know that it is just four minutes before the hour. If you feel like you need to leave um, at the top of the hour, absolutely. Don't 
feel like you have to stick around, but we're going to go ahead and um, open up the conversation. Um, I, I had a couple of thoughts, Tim. I saw a um, sculpture, and I believe it was in a churchyard or a schoolyard, but I think it was a churchyard in Stockholm. And it was, uh, I believe it was a bronze, but it was death. So it was this, this creature of death winged and sort of claw legged and and underneath its cloak it was holding a baby that was wrapped like in you know swaddling clothes of a baby almost in a real loving protective way this this creature of death was 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 taking this baby and I was so struck by that statue and I I know nothing about it I don't know who who um, made it. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it was just um, stunning. And I wondered if, you know, I mean, of course, uh, infant mortality rates were just huge back in whatever century that was, <laughs> that was conceived in, but I was really struck by it. So I have a photograph of it and I'll send it to you. Maybe we can track down who the artist was and the time that it was made. Um, but I had mentioned to him before the phone call that one of the things I've done here in my community is started an annual show called Departures, The Art of Leaving This Place. And so I, it's a collaboration with the uh, Salina Art Center Gallery. We put out a call to artists and we ask for work on um, death and dying and grief and transitions. And um, it's been stunning. It's completely different every year, of course. But we've had... Uh, entries from uh, a, well the first time I did the show was in um, Arizona before we moved here to Kansas and our youngest entrance entry was from a five-year-old girl who uh, drew a picture of her grandfather when he died and um, but it, it's just been an amazing thing and I uh, I just encourage you to to in whatever way you can in your own communities uh, get engaging with your uh with other people about art on this subject because it's it's just a never-ending resource <laughs> so um anyone else have something they'd like to add anya can you unmute yourself or maybe there we go there can we you go. hear me we good okay so I'm from Colorado and I just have to touch on the Columbine thing because I was there and I was in eighth grade and we at our middle school that we were at in a completely different part of town were able to make posters and stuff and, and then took those and joined that group and it was insanely profound so I just had to touch on that. Um, and letting kids go through the process of you know making those posters and take them to put them out you know with thousands and thousands of posters from all different schools and, and whatnot was very therapeutic for us as kids experiencing that. Um, the photo piece I wanted to touch on because my brother passed away in June and we had a home funeral for him and I was um, 18 years younger than him. And he lived in Oklahoma and we're in Colorado and my family had not taken a photo of my mother with all seven of her biological children ever in all of our lives. And so we have a photo now of my mom with all seven of her children because it was the only opportunity that we'd ever had because we were all together in one place and it is heartbreaking and very bittersweet but it's so beautiful and some of us have small smiles some of us look very despondent um and that's okay we were all in the moment at that moment and it's beautiful the spoken word piece um and for me it's music folk in particular. I'm very drawn to folky type music because they tend to talk a lot about life and death. Um, so music for me is huge and I know for a lot of other people as well. Um, William Elliot Whitmore has a few songs about, well tons of songs about death. A song about, you know, leave the porch light on for me uh, when I'm gone. Um, uh, his parents died when he was young so he has a lot of really um, deathy type music. Um, he has a song about the buzzards won't cry. The buzzards know you're dying and they're waiting for you to die and they're not going to cry when you're gone because it's, you know, they're going to, they're going to get what they, what they want and need. 
Um, so for me personally, music is a, a huge um, part of what I use as my memento mori and um, really appreciate after the fact when I'm in those places and just need to sort of listen to something somber and something that validates the, the good and the bad, the hard and the, and the beautiful of life and, and death. That's all I've got for now. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's, that's a beautiful sentiment. And I think what you were saying about, you know, your, your family photograph at your brother's home funeral, I mean, that really says it all, right? Like we, we capture these moments of, of grief and sadness. And, you know, obviously it's not a big, happy, smiling family photo, but you're able to look at that and to understand that that grief has a purpose and that you have that, that family representation and that you understand the importance of that, I think is, is fantastic. And um, it, it goes back to that story, you know, if, if we want to revisit that idea, what happens moving forward? If we do see home funerals come back into the mainstream, are we going to see home funeral photography come back as well? Um, it, it's an interesting idea. And it's interesting to think about the importance and the poignancy of those moments captured on film in a culture where every salad is captured on film and every toast is captured on film. How do we retain the importance of that memory in that particular event? Um, and, and that will be an interesting cultural shift um, to watch. But, but thank you. That's a, a absolutely perfect um, observation, all three of your points. Tell me the name of the singer-songwriter you were mentioning. <laughs> It's a plug. No, um, oh, it's Sam Wh Elliot. <laughs> William Elliot Whitmore. Oh, William uh, Elliot Whitmore. Yeah, he uh, he's amazing, and he's a a one man band for the most part. Um, I highly recommend him. And Brown Bird is another great one. Her husband. They sing a lot of songs about life and death. And her husband ended up dying of leukemia young, thirties, forties. Um, and they'd already had all this this body of music. And I hear his voice, and it just kills me it breaks my damn heart that he's gone um but it's fascinating because i wonder how that helped her process because they had so many songs about death and dying and and uh you know she can go back and and know that they created such magnificent art together um and uh, brown, what was her name brown bird uh their, her it was a couple um their band is brown bird brown b-r-o-w-n yep okay and um the Devil Makes Three has some pretty fun yeah. death type music too. Yeah, love those. Um, do we have any other volunteers or is it getting late and everyone's getting sleepy? Arlene, are you trying to unmute? No. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much for that presentation, Tim. Um, my two favorite things were the morning jewelry, which I think would be really nice to incorporate into a home funeral and, and the photographs, obviously, of, of, uh, of a celebration and a home funeral how, how important that would be to capture that um i'm in montana and um our group puts on a one-day conference every year with conversations with the living on death and dying gallatin valley circle of compassion.org and um we've given uh we the last two years we've had uh breakout sessions on home funerals and uh I'm working on getting a little more training, and um, I just really value the concept of, of a home fun funeral for saying goodbye and just bringing things back to the natural way. So that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for being here, Arlene.
Yeah, thank you. Um, all right, I didn't see anybody else jumping for their unmute buttons, so. Uh, I have one thing. Go ahead. In line with uh, Sarah, what you mentioned with the sculpture of death and um, kind of the feel of it, it reminded me of a video, um, Google the life of death, and it's on, um, I don't know how you pronounce Vimo, um, but the thumbnail is of death with a little deer. And I highly recommend that, uh, that little video, the little animation of the life of death and what it's like to be somebody who has to, you know, take life. Um, so it's really beautiful. Great, thank you. I'll, I'll look it up. Okay, well, um, I think that we're about ready to sign off. I'm going to just um, remind everybody to turn your clocks back tonight, unless you happen to be in Arizona or that weird little corner of Indiana. That, <laughs> or Hawaii, that's right, or Hawaii. Um, and, you know, I, I gave my donation spiel at the beginning, uh, just a reminder that this month we'll be putting all of the donors' names into a drawing and someone's gonna get all of the NHFA books in the end. And there's a bunch of ways you can donate and we thank you so much for your support and we're really looking forward to tomorrow night, which will be um, two uh, board members. Well, Lauren Carroll has just finished her term on the board and Danny Lavoir, and they're going to be uh, showing a demonstration video of after death body care and then a whole conversation afterwards. So we really hope you can join us tomorrow evening, same time, same room. All right. Thank you so much. This has been really great. Thanks, Tim.